Chapter Four of Tales of Mean Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Calkins. Tales of Mean Streets by Arthur Morrison. Chapter Four. Lizer's First. When Billy Chope married Lizerant, there was a small rejoicing. There was no wedding party because it was considered that what there might be to drink would be better in the family. Lizerant's father was not, and her mother felt no interest in the affair, not having seen her daughter for a year, and happening, at the time, to have a month's engagement in respect of a drunk and disorderly. So that there were but three of them, and Billy Chope got exceedingly tipsy early in the day, and in the evening his bride bawled a continual chorus while his mother, influenced by that unwanted quatern of gin the occasion sanctioned, wept dismally over her boy, who was much too far gone to resent it. His was the chief reason for rejoicing, for Lizerant had always been able to extract ten shillings a week from the pickle factory, and it was to be presumed that as Lizer Chope, her earning capacity would not diminish, and the wages would make a very respectable addition to the precarious revenue, depending on the mangle that Billy extorted from his mother. As for Lizer, she was married. That was the considerable thing, for she was but a few months short of eighteen, and that, as you know, is a little late. Of course there were quarrels very soon, for the new Mrs. Chope, less submissive at first than her mother-in-law, took a little breaking in and a liberal renewal of the manual treatment once applied in her courting days. But the quarrels between the women were comforting to Billy, a diversion and a source of better service. As soon as might be, Lizer took the way of womankind. This circumstance brought an unexpected half-crown from the evangelical rector who had married the couple gratis, for recognizing Billy in the street by accident and being told of Mrs. Chope's prospects, as well as that Billy was out of work, a fact undeniable, he reflected that his principles did on occasion lead to discomfort of a material sort, and Billy, to whose comprehension the half-crown opened a new field of receipt, would doubtless have long remained a client of the rector, had not that zealot hastened to discover a vacancy for a warehouse porter, the offer of presentation whereunto alienated Billy Chope forever. But there were meetings and demonstrations of the unemployed, and it was said that shillings had been given away, and as being at a meeting in a street was at least as amusing as being in a street where there was no meeting, Billy often went on the off chance. But his lot was chiefly disappointment, wherefore he became more especially careful to furnish himself ere he left home. For certain weeks cash came less freely than ever from the two women. Lizer spoke of providing for the necessities of the expected child, a manifestly absurd procedure, as Billy pointed out, since, if they were unable to clothe or feed it, the duty would fall on its grandmother. That was law, and nobody could get over it. But even with this argument, a shilling cost him many more demands and threats than it had used, and a deal more general trouble. At last, Lizer ceased from going to the pickle factory, and could not even help Billy's mother at the mangle for long. This lasted for near a week, when Billy, rising at ten with a bad mouth, resolved to stand no nonsense, and demanded two shillings. Two bob? What for? Lizer asked. Cause I want it. None of your lip. Ain't got it, said Lizer sulkily. That's a bleedin' lie. Lie yourself. I'll break you in arves, ye blasted effer. He ran at her throat and forced her back over a chair. I'll pull your face off. If you ain't give me the money, God buy me, I'll do for ye. Lizer strained and squalled. Let go. You'll kill me and the kid, too, she grunted hoarsely. Billy's mother ran in and threw her arms about him, dragging him away. Don't, Billy, she said in terror. Don't, Billy, not now. You'll get in trouble. Come away. She might go off and you get in trouble. Billy Chope flung his wife over and turned to his mother. Take your hands off me, he said. Go on, or I'll give you something for yourself. And he punched her in the breast by way of illustration. You shall have what I've got, Billy, if it's money, his mother said. But don't go and get yourself in trouble. Don't. Will a shillin' do? No, it won't. Think I'm a bloomin' kid. I mean having two bob this morning. I was a-keepin' it for the rent, Billy, but yes. Think of the bleedin' landlord for me, doncher. And he pocketed the two shillings. I ain't settled with you yet, my gal, 
he added to Lizer, milking about at home and idin' money. You wait a bit. Lizer had climbed into an erect position and, gravid and slow, had got as far as the passage. Mistaking this for a safe distance, she replied with defiant railings. Billy made for her with a kick that laid her on the lower stairs, and swinging his legs round his mother as she obstructed him, entreating him not to get in trouble, he attempted to kick again in a more telling spot. But a movement among the family upstairs and a tap at the door hinted of interference, and he took himself off. Lizer lay doubled upon the stairs, howling, but her only articulate cry was, "'God help me, it's coming!' Billy went to the meeting of the unemployed and cheered a proposal to storm the Tower of London. But he did not join the procession following a man with a handkerchief on a stick who promised destruction to every policeman in his path, for he knew the fate of such processions. With a few others he hung about the nearest tavern for a while, on the chance of the advent of a flush sailor from St. Catharines, disposed to treat out of workers. Then he went alone to a quieter bill-house and took a pint or two at his own expense. A glance down the music-hall bills hanging in the bar, having given him a notion for the evening, he bethought himself of dinner and made for home. The front door was open, and in the first room, where the mangle stood, there were no signs of dinner. And this was at three o'clock. Billy pushed into the room behind, demanding why. "'Billy,' Lizer said faintly from the bed, "'look at the baby!' Something was moving feebly under a flannel petticoat. Billy pulled the petticoat aside and said, that? Well, it is a measly snipe. It was a blind, hairless homunculus, short of a foot long, with a skinny face set in a great skull. There was a black bruise on one side from hip to armpit. Billy dropped the petticoat and said, Where's my dinner? I don't know, Liza responded hazily. What's the time? Time? Don't try to kid me. You get up. Go on. I want my dinner. Mother's getting it, I think, said Liza doctor had to slap him like anything for he'd cry you don't cry now much e go on out you get i don't want no more damn jaw get my dinner i'm a gettin of it billy his mother said at the door she had begun when he first entered it won't be a minute you come here you ain't always so ready to do work are ye she ain't no call to stop there no longer and i owe her one for this morning will ye get out or shall i kick ye she can't billy his mother said and Lizer snivelled and said, "'You're a damn brute. You ought to be bleeding well booted.' But Billy had her by the shoulders and began to haul, and again his mother besought him to remember what he might bring upon himself. At this moment the doctor's dispenser, a fourth-year London hospital student of many inches, who had been washing his hands in the kitchen, came in. For a moment he failed to comprehend the scene. Then he took Billy Choke by the collar, hauled him pell-mell along the passage, kicked him, hard into the gutter and shut the door when he returned to the room lizer sitting up and holding on by the bed frame gasped hysterically you bleedin makeshift i'd have your liver out if i could reach you you touch my husband you long pison and hound you ow an infirm of aim she flung a cracked teapot at his head billy's mother said you ought to be ashamed of yourself you low blackguard if his father was alive he'd knock your head off call yourself a doctor a passel of boys get out go out of my house or i'll give you in charge but why hang it he'd have killed her then to Liza, lie down shan't lay down keep off if you come near me i'll corpse ye you go while you're safe the dispenser appealed to billy's mother for god's sake make her lie down she'll kill herself i'll go perhaps the doctor had better come and he went leaving the coast clear for Billy Chope to return and avenge his kicking. End of chapter 4